Great, thank you. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we're going to focus on both opportunities and, and issues, really. Um, I am uh, uh, a patent attorney, so, um, so part of what we'll be discussing is IP rights in artificial intelligence, particularly on the uh, patent side. A little bit on, on trade secrets, uh, but in order to get CLE credit, we've got to have some sort of law in there. Uh, and so we'll include uh, some discussion of, of patents as we talk about uh, AI. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about what is artificial intelligence. We hear the term everywhere, uh, but what is it really? Uh, we'll talk about some examples of how it's used in hospitality, how it could be used, how it has been used. Uh, we'll talk about protecting AI inventions. Um, uh, you have some great new way of using it. What are the ways that we can protect it? Uh, another thing we're going to talk about is licensing issues with AI or procuring uh, AI type systems for your use. You don't have to necessarily build them all yourself. Uh, but sometimes when you work with others, there are issues that may arise. Uh, that's my, um, uh, my firm bio picture, if you're wondering what that, uh, that picture is on the right. So what is artificial intelligence? Uh, artificial intelligence is a type of computer science. It's a computer program that acts like a human. Uh, it has the capability to imitate intelligent human behavior, uh, it simulates the way a human would act, uh, but in but by a computer. Uh, the there is a subset of artificial artificial intelligence called machine learning. Now, machine learning is the uh, process in which it learns from its own output. It's gonna it's gonna take its uh, uh, its result and it's gonna figure out is that the result we were expecting and and how do we uh, refine our process to uh, to get a better result next time, and, and that's how the machine learns, and it and it can do it on its own. Uh, on the left, you see a uh, C3PO patent that's actually for the uh, for the appearance of C3PO, not for an actual robot uh, that uh, that has the functionality of C3PO, uh, and uh, and you can see from the date on it from the first Star Wars movie, uh, this is long been expired uh you have other types of ip that you're going to be infringing if you're thinking about uh selling a c3po but uh um these this is the basic construct of artificial intelligence with the subset of machine learning so there's different phases to implementing ai the first phase uh we're going to take our model and we're going to put in historical data uh, data that we uh, that we know uh, what the input is, and we know what the expected output should be. Uh, and we can, um, uh, if if we want uh, an AI model that that figures out the difference between a cat and a dog, we're going to put in our pictures of cats and dogs, and we're going to know which of them are supposed to be cats and which of them are supposed to be dogs, and we're going to tell the AI model this one should be a cat and this one should be a dog. And we're going to train it and tweak the, the weightings and the variables so that it understands how to get to that uh, output. Then another phase is going to be execution. We're actually going to use the model. So now a new picture comes in of, of an animal and the AI model is going to uh, take that picture and it's going to output whether it thinks it's a, a dog or a cat. And that's going to be the execution phase. And then the, um, the final type of phase, which is optional, not every, not every AI system has machine learning, uh, but machine learning will take the data input, uh, the new data input, the picture, it'll, uh, it'll determine whether it's a cat or a dog, and then it's gonna learn from that and say, you know, this one should have been a cat, uh, let's, um, let's tweak the way we do this. Or, um, or, oh, this is a new type of situation we're dealing with. This is a, a hairless dog. Let's, uh, let's figure out how to tweak our model to account for this type of situation. And so we have these different phases of, uh, of executing an AI model. And when we talk later about licensing issues, 
we will we'll talk about the importance of of having um, uh, of having each of these phases. Uh, we'll also want to consider each of these phases when we think about uh, patent protection and who could be infringing the patent and when they would be infringing. So one type of common artificial intelligence is referred to as a neural network. And when you look at that picture above, uh, your eyeball sees a cat and it's gonna go through this neural network in your brain and your brain is gonna determine this is a cat. It's gonna say, is this, is this thing a building? Is it an animal? Is it big? Is it little? Is it furry? Uh, does it have these pointy ears? Does it have a fur pattern that looks like a cat? Uh, is it something uh, in my family room or is it something uh, in a zoo? And, um, and, and you're gonna make the deduction, this is a cat. Uh, and, and there are instances where you look at an animal and you can see, well, I'm not really sure what that is. Uh, and, and that's your brain telling you, you don't have a full 100% likelihood uh, of knowing exactly what that animal is. Well, that's how uh, neural networks work as well. As it, work, as it works its way through the, the different nodes, uh, it's going to uh, give you the highest likelihood answer that it, that it could possibly be. Uh, you're gonna have these different, uh, different layers that perform different functions, uh, evaluate different aspects, and it's gonna assign a weighting, and it's gonna follow the path of the highest weighting and give you that, that result that they say, this is, we think the highest likelihood is that, is a, that this is a cat. Uh, not everything's gonna be 100%, uh, but sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes you can get uh, very close, and of, of course, that's that's the goal. Uh, as we go through the the training, as we go through machine learning, each of these nodes can be weighted differently. Uh, for instance, if uh, uh, if there is um, an analysis done as to uh, uh, the the size of the cat, and that that analysis is actually not that important to figuring out uh, whether it's a cat or a dog, uh, then, then maybe that, uh, that node, that determination uh, is given less weight. It, it's not as influential to the process. Now I wanna take a sidestep and talk about big data for a second. Big data is data that is too large for tr traditional computer to process. Uh, the computers that, I, that I'm talking to you through right now, the one that, that you have in front of you, these aren't the types of computers that, that can handle big data. We're talking about the kind of information uh, where it's so voluminous that it would just take way too long for the computer and, and just tie up the computer uh, entirely uh, trying to process that data and figure out trends or uh, or a result or a prediction. There's just so much of it. Uh, we're in the information age. Uh, this is a time uh, in technology where we just have massive amounts of data. We're trying to figure out what does it all mean and how do we monetize it? How do we utilize all of this data? Uh, artificial intelligence is one solution to solving this big data problem. How do we monetize all of that data? Well, artificial intelligence can do that for us. Uh, it could take the biometric data, social networking data, environmental data, surveys, reviews, all sorts of other uh, inputs, figure out trends, figure out correlation, and, uh, and make predictions. Uh, it can learn what's correlated. It can learn how to make a prediction uh, and, uh, and help humans make some of those uh, decisions if humans were able to ingest all of that information. And so you can imagine with... Uh, with social networking, for instance, it could take uh, all of those Instagram posts and, and uh, tweets and Facebook posts and, and put them all in to, uh, to a database, uh, figure out what's good, what's bad, how does it correlate to other things, and, uh, and figure out how to adjust uh, from there. So, uh, so, so the use of big data can be very, very powerful. Uh, but it's a, but it can be challenging to to harness all of it, 
AI is one way of, of doing that. So let's now talk about some applications in hospitality that, that utilize AI and in some instances use uh, big data. Uh, I'm going to talk about three uh, very briefly, uh, just three examples that I, uh, that I uh, came up with uh, that, that right on the top of my head. And uh, um, we're going to talk about customer service, targeted advertising, and, and some hotel-based functionality, some on-site functionality. Uh, the, the image on the right that says artificial intelligence in the middle, that's actually from the uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And this is how they break down uh, the different categories of artis artificial intelligence, whether it's use in speech, whether it's use in natural language processing, uh, vision, you know, the, it could be um, detecting whether something's a cat or dog or, or uh, augmented or virtual reality. Uh, there could be hardware associated with it. There, there's, different, there's different components to artificial intelligence. That's currently how the patent office is looking at it. Uh, so here's an example of one type of use of artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a customer that has questions. Maybe they want to make a reservation. Maybe they have questions about uh, a certain hotel. Uh, they can get on a website and they can chat with a chatbot. We've all done it before. We've we've uh, uh, utilized chatbots before. Many of them use um, a uh, a database of of answers. Uh, based on a particular type of question, uh, or they have a simple enough algorithm to say, if they ask us, if they ask uh, about my next reservation, go into this database and pull it from here. Uh, there's a way to tie it to an AI engine so that it's, uh, it, it's smarter. It acts more like a human, like an AI uh, engine should. And the chatbot uh, can, can maybe understand the context better of what you're asking. It can understand uh, the mood you're in of what you're asking, uh, and sometimes that Boolean searching of just taking that that um, the the language out of uh, the the text from what you've typed and and putting that into your search engine doesn't always get the, the best answer, but but oftentimes a chatbot with AI uh, is better at, at understanding uh, the communication with the human. Uh, likewise. Uh, customer can call a call center. Uh, that chatbot uh, won't be one where you're typing in the answers, but maybe acts as more of an IVR type system. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the system where you call in and it, uh, it says, press one if you uh, want to make a new reservation and press two if you want to talk about an existing reservation. That can be uh, a discussion with a machine that doesn't have to appear like it is a machine. In fact, we've seen solutions where the chatbot is integrated with the actual human customer service representative. So there's certain times the agent can hand you off to the chatbot very seamlessly, and you can, uh, you can talk with the chatbot as though you're continuing that conversation, and then the agent can, can pick it back up. And that can be particularly useful for things like uh, giving disclaimers or taking uh, credit card information or or uh, other things where we can have the, the uh, agent using their time more productively uh, doing other things. Uh, one of the highest costs to a call center is is the human. So to the extent we could push them off to a machine, push the actions off to a machine, uh, the better off we'll be. Uh, I know we have a bunch of people from uh, from Hilton on the line here. Uh, and so uh, maybe maybe you'll relate to this example here. This is a, an example of customer service in person. So a customer uh, is at your hotel. Uh, maybe they go to the concierge, and we can have an, an AI engine that interacts with the customer there. Uh, Hilton's Connie, uh, from a few years back, tried to solve that that problem. Uh, the the solution here doesn't necessarily need to be in the form of a robot. Uh, it could be uh, in any form. It could be a computer in the form of uh, an Amazon Echo uh, that, that sits in, in your hotel room uh, rather than being at a uh, concierge desk. 
Uh, but the point is that we can have a um, we can have a device uh, where the customer can interact with them directly, with, with the device directly, and uh, it's fed by this AI engine to give the information uh, that they need, uh, and maybe even feed uh, more specific information to that customer based on uh, their preferences. Targeted content has been around for for decades, right? We all get the the mass mailings uh, that you're approved for a credit card or or whatever it is. Uh, but but now we have AI and we have big data to make more sense of of what's likely to be uh, a sale, what's going to be more useful, uh, and so the customer goes on a on a website. This could be going on to the hotel website. This could be going on to the website of a particular property. Could be to make a reservation. It could be to uh, uh, to look at details about the reservation, get additional information, uh, or it could be a different website. And maybe there's advertising on this website, and we can take information about that customer, whether it's uh, 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 the the big data uh, about their social network feed. Uh, maybe they're looking for a particular type of hotel, and they're asking their friends about it. Uh, maybe we want to consider uh, the weather of where they're going. Uh, maybe we, we can figure out from LinkedIn that they're going to, uh, to a conference and have different needs than if they were traveling with their family. And we can adjust the advertising. We can adjust pricing. We can adjust preferences and learn about preference, learn about their room preference uh, for business versus family travel and, and where they, what kind of hotel they like. Do they like it in a certain location of a city or or certain room located on the floor and how many beds or types of beds, uh, you know, rather than just presenting all the different options to them, uh, we can make a more educated guess as to what they're probably looking for with the use of AI that's taking that big data and even learning from the customer's past actions. We can all use, also use it for on-site functionality. So here's just an example of a hotel room uh, and we could use AI to help control the door lock. Uh, the thermostat, we've seen Nest and Honeywell type thermostats that, that learn about the environment. Well, we can also uh, have it be user-based and learn about those users, users' preferences. Uh, programming on the, on the TV, uh, maybe movie selection can be tailored to, uh, to that individual. Uh, how they like their water temperature, what type of utilities uh, usage to expect uh, with that uh, with that individual, uh, you know, what type of habits have we seen from them in the past, and maybe we can uh, we can gauge some of these things differently uh, and price them out differently, uh, and, and make it a better customer experience for that uh, for that that customer. Uh, other things we could do, we could automate check in and check out, uh, use, uh, use it for housekeeping services and, and figuring out when they need to be there, when they shouldn't be there, uh, and, and assigning rooms. Uh, all can be done more easily, uh, enhancing the ability of what a human was doing, uh, but doing it more efficiently and, and uh, basing it on a lot more data uh, that would be useful to, uh, to make that, that decision. So let's turn to some IP protection here. Uh, we have two types of, of IP protection I, I want to talk about briefly. One is patents, the other is trade secrets. Uh, now patents are available to protect something functional uh, or even the ornamental features of it. Uh, we see uh, at the bottom that there, there's utility to protect the structure and function and there's design that protects the ornamental features. The, um, the patents are great against competitors. Uh, if you're going to come up with a new idea and you want to protect it, it's kind of like your insurance policy to say, we've come up with this. How do we make this proprietary so that our, our competitors can't get their own developers make this themselves? Uh, and patents are really the best way to do that. It basically, by disclosing the idea to the public, uh, you are given a monopoly for about 20 years where you can exclude others from using that idea. You can go to a court and tell them 
uh, our competitor is using this idea. You have to make them stop or give us uh, some sort of payment for it. So patents can be uh, can be useful uh, for um, for that type of uh, that type of competitive advantage. Uh, the the patent application itself is usually publicly available, though there are ways to keep it hidden from public until it becomes a patent. Uh, so we have to think eventually it's going to be publicly available, but then at that point we'll have that limited monopoly. Trade secrets, on the other hand, uh, are they have to be made secret, right? They have to be something related to your business that's, that's kept secret. And it's more than just saying, I'm not going to patent this. Uh, it has to be something where you have a program, uh, a trade secret program, where you say, here's how we're going to restrict access to this idea. Here's how we're going to keep it hidden from uh, other employees. Here's how we're going to keep it in a certain location, only accessible by uh, these particular individuals. Here's the uh, documentation that describes what is this trade secret, and um, uh, and here are the steps we're going to take to uh, to make sure that that others can't uh, obtain it. We're going to label the documents as as trade secret. Uh, we're always going to encrypt them, right? We're going to take those steps to show we really did our best to try to protect this. Uh, as a trade secret. Now, if a competitor comes up with that uh, idea on their own that was in your trade secret, I have Coca-Cola here as an example, uh, if if Pepsi comes up with their own version of it uh, that's similar to, to Coca-Cola, uh, they haven't done anything wrong. Oftentimes, trade secrets are helpful against former employees. Someone takes the idea, goes to a new company, and wants to start uh, using it there. Uh, or you're working with a consultant of some sort, and that consultant uh, takes that uh, idea and starts using it with another company. Uh, and as a side note, of course, we should think when we're, we're using non-disclosure agreements for this type of technology, uh, we should try to carve out trade secret protection from the non-dis- non-disclosure confidential protection. The NDA protection might expire two, three years, uh, whatever it is based on based on the state, but we want trade secret protection to last indefinitely, right, until we've decided we want to make it public, uh, if that ever is. So let's take just a quick look at a, uh, at a patent here as an example that has nothing to do with, uh, with AI, it has to do with um, uh, Amazon, which certainly does plenty of, uh, of AI-related technology, but this is a patent where Jeff Bezos is an inventor. Uh, now the patents don't have your uh, uh, your picture on it, uh, but um, this is a patent for uh, a a mobile phone or or a case for a mobile phone where when you uh, drop it, these little boosters will keep it from hitting the ground, or or you have little springs to to have it bounce uh, when it hits the ground, and and your phone won't won't break. Um, Jeff Bezos thought it was a great idea. Uh, he's a better businessman than I am. Uh, I haven't seen this one really take off yet, and it's about 10 years old. Uh, so, so I'm gonna still reserve my judgment, but I kind of think this one might be a dud. Uh, so, this is what what the patent looks like on the left side here. Uh, we have a sample picture uh, on the first page, gives you some of the bibliographical information about the title and the inventors and the owner of the patent and when it was filed and uh, who examined it and then. The prior art that was considered in that type of thing. The most important part of a patent is the claims, and the the claims define your property right. If you think about real property, uh, the deed to to your land, it's much easier to define real property, right? You could say it's between this longitude and this longitude, and between this latitude and this latitude. You can say it's from uh, the tree to the river, or from the power line to the street. Right? There's different ways to define uh, what that um, what that land is, what that property is. But intellectual property is more challenging. So for patents, we have these claims, and the claims are used uh, for two purposes. One is patentability. Uh, the examiner is going to take the claims and compare it to the prior art, and say uh, say has this been done before or is it an obvious variation of what's been before? Uh, and the 
other purpose of it is once you get a patent, once you convince the examiner that it's different from the prior art, uh, then this is the, what you're going to use to see if someone's infringing. And if someone were to, to perform each and every step or, or contain each and every component of the claim, then they're going to be infringing. One thing is different, they're not going to be infringing that claim and they uh, are no longer liable. So if we just want to run through this claim quickly, a uh, method for protecting the portable device that includes an airbag deployable from the side of the portable device. Uh, right? So a so, uh, portable device, we're talking about a, um, uh, a cell phone, most likely a mobile phone, but, uh, but because the term portable device is used, it, it could be broader, could be uh, an iPad, a laptop, right, that type of thing. So we're going to detect that the portable device will impact a surface. Uh, so this is this means that uh, we're we're figuring out that it's about to hit the ground. Uh, so uh, the decision has to be made before it hits the ground, not after it hits the ground. Prior to impact, determine if a risk of damage uh, it exceeds a damage threshold. Uh, when the risk of damage exceeds a damage threshold, then we're going to alter the orientation using an airbag and deploy the airbag prior to impact with the surface. Uh, and so that's, um, if you were to have a device that did that, those are the, uh, those, uh, then, then you'd be infringing that, that claim. If you were to do something different, for instance, such as uh, determine a risk of damage uh, um, after it, it impacts the surface, uh, or if you were to not even have that step, if you just detect that it's going to impact the surface and then deploy uh, the, the airbag, uh, then you wouldn't even be performing that prior to impact with the surface step and you wouldn't be infringing. So that's a way that we, we look at these claims. They're, they're included at the end of the patent uh, when you read it, which is kind of unfortunate. It's the most important part. Uh, but, uh, but when we read a patent, we go, us patent attorneys go right to the claims. That's the most important part. Now, you might be thinking, you keep telling me about patents, but, but I don't necessarily want to sue my competitors. We, you know, we, we are in a, um, uh, we're not in this arms race. We're, we're kind of, uh, uh, you know, we're not in the mood to start a war. Well, here are some examples of things you could use uh, patents for other than litigation. Uh, you can use it for, uh, it's helped to get R&D tax credits. You could use it for employee recognition. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes employees, uh, particularly when we when it comes to engineers and, and developers and, uh, and some of the younger generation too, they want to be part of an innovative company. And by showing that you recognize innovation, uh, it attracts more innovators and and uh, uh, keeps the innovators uh, uh, at the company. Um, you can use it with vendors. Uh, a vendor maybe has a, uh, has software that they use with you and you come up with an idea that enhances their offering uh, and you could say hey we'll give you um, we'll give you the rights to our patent if you reduce the cost of this product to us and and I've seen that uh, quite a bit uh, and, uh, and and it's a popular approach for uh, um, for getting patents and, and and making some money off of it some real money uh, and then of course there's ways to uh, uh, assert against others and and uh, whether it's filing suits or sending letters uh, to those in your industry and, and those outside your industry uh, as well. Now protecting AI type types of inventions, uh, there there are a few things I, I want to uh, denote here. Uh, so the patents protect the functionality, right? We were talking, it's got to be uh, useful. It's got to be new. It's got to be non-obvious. Uh, it's got to it's got to be different than what's been been done before. And, and really, we're going after uh, how it works. We are not going to get into the level of detail of the uh, the equations, the particular weightings of each of the nodes. Let's say in your neural network. Instead, we're going to talk about the inputs that go in. If there's a particular type of model being used, uh, the output coming out and oftentimes the action that we might take with that, with that output. So we want to use it to determine 
programming on your TV. We're going to talk about all the inputs that go in. We're going to talk about a type of model that we use, uh, some outputs to it, and how we might uh, change the guide, for instance, so that you have uh, a more customized uh, TV guide. Uh, the source code is never used in PEBS. Uh, we are never going to use uh, the actual code. Uh, the code will never be made public through the uh, patenting process. Uh, copyrights can be used to, uh, to protect your source code. Uh, we can even uh, protect uh, trade secrets with copyrights. There are some approaches to doing that. And, and so always, always an avenue to uh, consider protecting software, whether it's trade secret, or copyright, or patent, or all three of them for a single product. Uh, the picture on the right is uh, uh, the patent office. Uh, it, it only goes up to, to 2020, but they were showing the number of AI inventions, what they consider AI inventions. And they were trying to correlate it to uh, the, their, new, their new law that they enacted uh, around that time. Uh, in reality, uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily reflective of, of their law. Uh, of the law that they implemented and Congress implemented, uh, but probably more the case law uh, that that opened the door to uh, to these types of things, uh, as well as the economy. Uh, the, we had this dot com boom. Uh, we had a case that said you could patent just about anything, uh, and a big spike around 2000 2001, uh, and then we had the recession around 2008, uh, and some case law making it harder to patent. Right, and, and so, so I think it more follows case law and the economy more than it does their uh, uh, their their laws. However, we are still seeing that upward trend, right? And that's that's really the takeaway from this is is the number of patents uh, in AI is really increasing. Uh, not everything used to be called AI or machine learning in in the past. There were other terms uh, that were used, uh, but but it's becoming more and more. Uh, popular and, and it's becoming a big part of what we do at the patent office. Now, we talked about this difference between uh, uh, patents and, and trade secrets. Uh, when we look at an AI model, we talked about how we have uh, the input to the model, uh, we have the model itself, and we have we have an output. There are some things we want to keep secret. Maybe those weightings to the model, maybe the, al the algorithms inside that black box, we want to keep secret. And those might be protected by a trade secret. Uh, and only the employees involved in it would, would know. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the output might be used in a way on a chatbot or some functionality at a hotel where, where it's going to be consumer facing. And the, the consumer might not see the AI behind it. Uh, but it's going to be used in a way that we might want to protect how we use social media to change the um, programming on the TV for a hotel guest. Uh, and, and we can protect that with a patent without going into the, uh, the details of that model, which we say for the trade secret protection. So there's different ways to balance uh, this type of protection. There are some challenges. Uh, one challenge is what we call patent eligibility. Patent eligibility is, is in the, uh, the patent law as 35 USC section 101. And when you think 101, it is, uh, it is the first statute. It's the thing that, that, that you have to cross to uh, become patentable. And back in, in the late 90s, uh, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit basically said, you can patent anything. There's a few exceptions to it. It can't be some idea in your head. Uh, it can't be a law of nature. Um, uh, it can't be just math. But, um, but pretty much everything else is patentable other than a, a few exceptions. Uh, the Supreme Court a few years ago, uh, 2014, uh, came out and said, you know, it, it really has to be something that's more than just uh, automating what a human would do, more than just putting it on the internet uh, and using a computer because we know a computer is more efficient. We know a computer is used to 
send and transmit and receive data. We know it's used to uh, sort data. Uh, so um, it's computer store data. Like we know all these basic computer functionality. Uh, we know that if you want to do a calculation, it's easier to do it on a computer than to do it in your head or on pen and paper. So uh, we can't give you a patent just because you decided to use a computer to do it. And what they were really going after was, uh, we don't want you to take some process that's been done for decades and then make a website that does it uh, or an app that does it and say, ah, now I can preclude everyone else from doing it when it's natural to just use the latest technology to, to do that. But the effect it had was, was pretty severe, it really swung the needle uh, against getting patents for many types of softwares. Now that that pendulum has uh, has swung back, uh, but with with many restrictions to it. Now, one of the things I was saying was was we can't have uh, we can't get a patent for something that that uh, mirrors what a human would be doing. You can't just automate human behavior. Well, the problem with AI as far as patenting is concerned, is we are automating what a human would be doing, right? The very, the very definition that we talked about earlier for Merriam-Webster is that we are, we are mimicking human behavior. Uh, and here we are saying, well, you can't get a patent for just mimicking human behavior. So uh, we have an interesting dichotomy. We have a way of, of addressing that by focusing more on what the computer is doing and focusing on certain actions that they're doing. Right? Maybe it's the prediction aspect, maybe it's the training aspect, uh, maybe it's the uh, machine learning, but, uh, uh, but there are certain aspects to the AI process uh, that uh, aren't a one-for-one -one, uh, uh, automation of what a human might do. So uh, we don't necessarily put that uh, in, in your hands. When you come talk to us about an invention, uh, we figure out how to characterize the invention in a way that it's most likely to be patentable. Uh, another interesting challenge is we want to target competitors, uh, but we still want to be able to detect infringement. So uh, we might say, um, uh, we might talk about this great AI program uh, and, and all the stuff that's happening on the back end, uh, how it uses uh, social networking and how it weights it compared to uh, uh, how it compares it to the weather and how it compares it to something else and uh, and different types of deep neural networks and and it's all great and the patent office loves it and they issue a patent but then you look at it and you're like well, we have no idea if the, if the competitors are actually doing this because they're not giving us any details as to how their system works so one of the things we want to consider there is how do we characterize this invention, remember going back to the claims, we're going to characterize this invention in a way that uh, it's different than the prior art, uh, but also describes what competitors might do at a level where we think we could detect that. And that's probably going to be done in um, uh, by using marketing materials and other things. Everyone likes to brag about how they use uh, AI, and we can, uh, we can oftentimes determine not just through their marketing materials, but, but sometimes uh, by looking at what it's doing, we can figure out, oh, well, the, really the only way they could have done this with AI is to use this certain uh, approach. And, and there are certain inherent characteristics of a, of a system that, that we know uses AI. Uh, a, an issue came up in the last couple of years about whether a robot, an, an artificial intelligence engine could be an inventor. And uh, there are times when, when there are companies that will put a whole bunch of information into a computer program and the computer program will suggest combinations, suggest solutions based on those inputs. And the, uh, uh, the company here that was involved said, well, the, the computer then should be the inventor. And the patent office said, no, no, uh, an inventor has to be a person, uh, has to be a human being, can't be, can't be a computer. And that's generally the way that, uh, that patent offices around the world have held. There have been a few exceptions. However, uh, those exceptions are generally countries where they don't do examination. 
uh, and they just rubber stamp whatever you give them and say, all right, you get a patent and, oh, your machine is the inventor? That's fine with us, whatever it is. Uh, and they just sort of let it slide through and collect your money and, and go on with their day. Uh, now, I think about it uh, uh, a little bit differently. Yeah, it matters that the law says that it's got to be a person but or an individual, but the um, logistically, I think someone when you submit an invention you have to sign a declaration you have to understand the declaration and you have to submit it uh a computer can't really understand what it what it means and the effect of it on them by signing it or or if they don't believe in what it means to to sign it uh we also during patent litigation sometimes want to depose an inventor well how do we depose a machine right that's not really that's not really fair to the uh uh the defendant in the case when they can't uh, depose the the responsible party who supposedly invented the the idea. So just logistically, there's all sorts of things that that crop up that uh, that make it clear that really there's no way a computer can be an inventor. Uh, the um, another issue that you might have seen recently in the news uh, involves sentience. Uh, sentience is where a um, uh, really where a computer has feelings and uh, and can can kind of respond to things and and more understand them uh, the the robots you see in in movies have sentience where uh, uh, where they understand and and have uh, emotions as a result to uh, what's being said or done uh, the c three p o s the terminators right that type of thing so uh there was an inventor, an, an engineer at Google that was working on a uh, platform called Lambda. And uh, he's got a colorful past, uh, but, but this, invent, this engineer, I shouldn't call him an inventor, this engineer said, uh, my software is sent to you. And the, the headline was, Google fires an engineer because he says his software is sent to you. Uh, some more details as to what happened there was that the uh, the engineer um, said the software uh, wanted to see a lawyer. Uh, a lawyer consulted with the software, and then the lawyer made all these filings on behalf of the software. And Google sent a cease and desist and also uh, put the engineer on administrative leave. Uh, the, the engineer was, was asked about um, uh, this, this computer program, Lambda, and, and uh, asked, like, could it die? And uh, he got, um, uh, he was very much like, uh, you know, I don't want to talk about it, but, but it's very much like a human being, and, and this thing, uh, I'd be very sad, and it, um, he's obviously very, very close to his software. Uh, I don't think it it meets the uh, what we consider sentient yet, but but we're getting there. Um, we are getting to a place where it's becoming more and more uh, intelligent. It's hard to say whether we are years or decades away from it, uh, but uh, but I don't think we're there yet. Pardon the interruption. At this time, I'll announce the second CLE code. For those seeking CLE credit today, please type the following five-digit code in the polling box on your screen and record it on your attorney affirmation form if applicable, which can be found on the resources tab on your screen. The second code is O as in Oscar, W as in William, 6, U as in uniform, J as in John. Again, that's O as in Oscar, W as in William, 6, U as in uniform, J as in John. Please record this code in the appropriate places, and I will turn it back over to Eric. Thank you. So now if we think about protecting big data innovations, uh, we have some challenges there too. Uh, once again, we have the patent eligibility concern. Uh, and, and the issue here is we're taking all this data and, and we're saying we could take all this data and we can make some sense out of it. And the patent office says, yeah, but we don't really care if you have 
uh, 10 data records or a million data records. Uh, unless you tell us it matters how many data records, uh, we can make it just a few, and then it seems like a, a fairly simple thing that's not all that complex. Uh, and so that's that's uh, uh, one challenge uh, that we have for uh, for patent eligibility. Uh, we also, of course, still have the the prior art uh, situation and and thinking about how do we convey this invention in a way that that overcomes what's been done before. Right? There have been, uh, if we think about advertising different ways of interpreting sales and uh, uh, seasonal attributes and, and figuring out how to uh, best advertise something. Uh, and so what is the technical aspect to it that's so new? Is it is it how we store the data, how we use the data or combine it? Or, or you know, is it the use of, of AI with it that, that makes it uh, so novel? And so, so different ways to protect uh, big data innovations. Uh, this is an actual uh, scenario that we dealt with recently for uh, an artificial intelligence model. We had uh, company A was putting data into a model. They created the model, uh, the original model. Company B was also putting in data uh, and, uh, and finding other customers like company B to use the model. And, uh, and so company C was putting in their own data uh, the output was coming to company C, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the output was also going back into the model to, to train it so that we had a trained version of the model and the output was going to company B as well. Now the agreement here, there were, there were two different types of agreements. One was the agreement between company A and company B. And the question was who owned the model? Uh, who owned the original model? Who owned the trained model? Uh, who owned the data that was uh, going into the model and who owned the data going out of the model. Now, it all seems okay uh, when the companies are getting along, but uh, when the companies decide to stop working together, uh, what do we do then with the, with the data? Uh, how, do we, uh, how do we rip out the model? Can we even take the model and, uh, and, and say, well, this is ours and we're going we're gonna to take this with us? Or is it so integrated with with information from another company that you can't do that. Um, likewise, there's also an agreement between, uh, in this case, it was company B and company C uh, to offer this this model to them. And what rights does company C have? Right? They can't give them access to company B's data uh, and company B doesn't get access to company C's data, uh, but company C has rights to the model itself and, uh, and company B uh, is able to train the data train the model using the data from from company C. Uh, so we want to think when, when we want to think about licenses and, and how we can um, how we can best protect ownership of our rights here. Uh, who owns the data going in? Who owns the model itself? Who owns the uh, the trained model versus the original model? Uh, if if the relationship fell apart, uh, would you be able to take that with you? And, and do you have language conveying that you'd be able to take that, that model with you, even if it's hosted uh, somewhere else? So a lot of agreements talk about maybe copyright protection, uh, but, but a lot of this doesn't fall under copyright protection. Uh, it, doesn't talk, it doesn't fall necessarily under uh, data rights. And so uh, the model itself, the, the idea of having uh, a particular algorithm and weighted variables in that algorithm and, and training it, uh, it is something that we want to be more specific about in our agreements moving forward. A uh, couple other issues. You're not necessarily going to, uh, going to always build an AI model yourself. Uh, sometimes you might, sometimes you might even go to, uh, to another entity and, and use their AI model. There are issues of bias with AI models, and it's not intentional. There's um, there's cognitive bias. Cognitive bias is where uh, we have um, uh, the data scientists that program it uh, impart their own bias to the to the algorithm, uh, or maybe you have an incomplete data set, uh, and the data set's not representative of, of everyone. And to give you an example, uh, if we have this um, this dog versus cat type 
type algorithm again, and you had um, you had a data set of of uh, ninety nine cats and one hairless dog, uh, and then you get a um, uh, another dog as your uh, uh, as your input. You're only going to see that that the dogs you have are hairless, and so you might just assume it's a cat because it has fur on. So uh, it's not that anyone uh, was intentional, but you don't have enough data to uh, to accurately represent uh, everyone or all, or all groups. And so when we are acquiring um, when we're acquiring an AI algorithm, when we are building it, we want to test it for. For bias, uh, it could be used for human resources. It could be used for uh, uh, for for customers, and we want to make sure uh, by by testing it with uh, uh, with with known data and seeing how what the output's like. Make sure it's not uh, a racial bias or geographic bias or or uh, something like that. Uh, the last point I'll mention before we wrap up here is that not all AI is actually AI. There are a lot of companies out there that are promoting themselves as having a great AI solution. And so just because uh, it, it's a, an algorithm that tries to resemble what a human's doing, it's not necessarily uh, all that intelligent. Uh, and so if we look at even chatbots from, from a few years ago, we'll see something like that. So it's usually gonna involve some sort of learning, some sort of uh, machine learning or training type aspect to it to really be uh, considered AI. Uh, there are a few different types of technologies that fall under the AI uh, umbrella that that are more likely to be AI, uh, but but don't necessarily uh, take them at their word that it's artificial intelligence. Uh, let's look at it. Let's see what it does. Uh, let's see how it learns uh, and and how it uses that information to provide the output uh, to figure out if it's it's not just presenting what you want, but it's uh, uh, it's really the technologically advanced thing that that you think you're paying for. Uh, so we have a few minutes left for, for questions. Otherwise, uh, you can feel free to ask those questions uh, uh, later on today at the end of the program. 